So welcome everyone and thank you very much for attending. We are very fortunate tonight to have Mary and Sally um, give up their time to present some information and also answer questions at the end. Um, both Mary and Sally are world renowned in this area. As I said, we're very fortunate to have them both um, involved in Pony Club and involved in Australia in this area. So. Mary has a master's degree in special ed and coaching qualifications with BHS, EA and RDA and has worked all over the world coaching, eventing, para equestrian and RDA riders. So um, Mary's also published um, many books and has a program where she's able to reach coaches across the world via video training. And um, the clinics that Mary has run are in countries including Canada, Dubai, England, Hong Kong, Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, Philippines, Portugal, Singapore, Singapore Taiwan and the US. So she's certainly um, world renowned for her expertise in this area. Sally will be very well known to um, most of you. Uh, Sally was also the recipient of an Order of Australia medal in 2019 for services to horse sports and to people with a disability. Sally's been a team assistant at five Paralympic Games, the World Para Equestrian Championships and the World Equestrian Games. And has, Sally has coaching accreditations with EA, PCA and RDA and is very well integrated in the Pony Club Victoria system and provides lots of assistance in evaluating um, applications for members who are seeking exemptions so that they're able to compete safely and fairly. And we celebrated Sally in 2021 as she was one of the recipients of the PCA Gillian Rolton Award for a Pony Club alumnus. So thank you very much and now we will hand over to Sally and Mary. As I said we'll take questions at the end um, the, the question panel is there for you to type in your questions as we go. And as we've publicised before this webinar, we are going to set a quick um, test for people who are participating. And if you are an active Pony Club coach, then you are able to get continuing professional development points to assist with your coach accreditation by both attending the seminar, watching it on YouTube afterwards and completing the exam. So without further ado then, we will hand over to Sally and Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And it's great to be able to share our love of coaching and coaching riders of all abilities. So we're often asked, how do we describe someone with a disability? And the first thing are, is that they're a person, they just happen to have a disability. So if you're introduced, somebody doesn't say, oh, she wears glasses, but she's called Susan. So it's just the same thing. Their first is that, that they're a person and then they have the disability or they have special needs. So you never say um, they're a disabled rider. Years ago, the British dresser, um, para question dressage team was, they were the disabled dressage. And finally, they all made a huge fuss about it and they changed it. Because it's really, it's all about dressage, not about disability in the same way that this is about a person, not the problems they have. Do you want to add? No, 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 just about the special needs. Yes. So they can be varied. Yes. Okay, on you go. Yes, and why join the Pony Club? Well, it is a wonderful youth movement and it is a youth movement for um, people, riders of all levels. So that's why it's really fantastic that we're able to share 
uh, knowledge from the RDA field into the Pony Club field. So it is great, Pony Club. It's always very proud, the individual clubs, of their uniform. Um, and nowadays with the, um, the polo shirts and the, um, the jackets that the Pony Clubs are producing for all riders to feel they belong to this great club that they represent um, at rallies as well as when they're going out competing. So that brings you down to the fun and enjoyment of being a part of a club and that you are accepted by everyone at the club, people of uh, your own age and then developing friendships with um, people that become your mentors at clubs. And another wonderful thing is that it is such a family-oriented um, club where family members are very involved to ensure clubs are running correctly. Um, and it's wonderful then you can really develop lifelong friendships um, from being a member of Pony Club. It's also really in, important to be able to develop um, horsemanship, horse mastership skills um, and riding skills to improve your riding to then go on and be able to participate in different competition opportunities uh, involving the different disciplines that Pony Club enables riders to be involved in. Now this is just a wonderful shot of uh, um, a rider that started off with RDA, uh, developed skills and then became involved in Pony Club. So that's Sarah and she belongs to Dalmore. Tour and Dalmore Pony Club, which I'm wearing a jacket off. Because you belong. Yes, because I'm one of the, well, I'm the chief instructor of that club. So I have run for many years integrated camps for teenagers and children, and um, I've always found that if you have two buddies for one rider with a disability, that the two people don't feel that they're going to be left out of something. If you just have one buddy and one rider, then the buddies mightn't be quite so keen. It's quite interesting because with boys, they're normally happy to have one boy that they're looking after um, and they don't seem to mind, but girls... Uh, like to be in their clique and they don't like to have to miss out on anything. So also, so I would suggest that if, if you have a rider with special needs that's coming to you, that you find two people that would be happy to buddy them. And also the same with parents. Um, so a parent comes, they're, they have a child with a disability. Uh, they've had a lot of failure and now they're doing something that they're going to be able to do for their child that's positive. So I think it's really important to have a buddy parent that can take the parent around and just look after them. And if they have any questions, they can ask that person. Otherwise, if you just picture somebody coming to... Uh, to a pony club rally, they don't know who to ask. They don't know who anyone is. So it's a bit nerve wracking for them. And I've also found that um, rider coming in tends to, if they come to do, as we'll show, the come and see day, um, that they may see a member that they immediately look up to and they can be the perfect person to be that the um, one of the buddies or the initial buddy. So just um, have that in mind that it may be an older member that becomes the first initial buddy. But the other thing is that it doesn't actually need to be someone that has special needs so that somebody new that's coming to your club, it might be quite nice to have a parent and a rider 
uh, that can actually help them and just look after them and make sure they're in the right place at the right time. Because you're told to go to Arena 2. Well, how do you know which Arena 2 is? You've got no idea. So I like the buddy system. I think it works well. Yes, and the come and see day um, is incredibly important um, for all new members. It's just so that they really understand how Pony Club works and the plan of the day that the Pony Club um, put out as well as the plan that they will have to develop to be able to um, participate happily um, and not get into a, a state of anxiety for not knowing what's going on. So we've um, gone through everything that we think that you need for that come and see, the come and try day. And, and some uh, clubs have a um, couple of come and try days before a, a rider makes the decision whether they're going to join the club. And I think in this instance, for um, people, riders, participants with disabilities, special needs, it's very important that you do have the, the trial system as well. So, as you can see, Abby doesn't have any hands. Um, she does everything, including doing up bridles, putting bridles on, doing them up, but it just takes her a little bit longer. So the, you've just got to realise that if people have um, different needs, that you have to give them longer to get ready to do something. So you can't say, you can't clap your hands and say, good, well, you've got five minutes in which to get ready and I'll meet you out on the cross country because they may need 20 minutes to get ready. And then you have, do you help them or do you not help? Um, that really is the question. And ask them, because how much do you let somebody struggle? Abby will ask for help if she needs it, but it's surprising how able she is. And also in the certificates, when they're doing the certificates and doing the um, salary and uh, all those types of things within that certificate and the um, horse mastership, horsemanship stuff. Um, again, you've got to really think of when you're timetabling it, the time that they will need, maybe that extra time, and um, how you tackle those situations if they actually do need assistance to be able to um, do bandaging a wound or, or whatever. So those are things that you do have to keep in mind. For certificate days. Okay, now both Sally and I find that if you're teaching and you don't have a spotter, you have to be looking at your rider with special needs, which means that you're going to not give the other riders the attention that they also need. So having a spotter, um, and it could be a parent, uh, or it could be someone who isn't riding on that day for some reason, you need to take them away from their friends. If you're a spotter, you are concentrating on the rider. And the job of the spotter is to be watching to see if your rider gets into any trouble. Or it could be that other horses get too close. Maybe you have a deaf rider and they can't hear horses coming up or you have someone that's not very stable and so then the spotter can have a look when they need to go and help them. And it's actually like team coaching really. Um, so it's a, a spotter who's wanting to train to become a coach. It's a wonderful thing for them to do um, because they're a part, part of the lesson, seeing how the more experienced coach is uh, running the session um, and also uh, the coach will discuss with them how if situations do come up, safety type situations, how um, they can, de can assist to make sure that um, it gets sorted out quickly and efficiently and safely. I want to get rid of that, but I 
don't want to no, find don't. I have yes. nothing. Don't, don't try. Um, so the other thing is that every rider doesn't have to do the same thing as everyone else, which if you've got a class lesson of six or eight riders, they're not going to all be doing the same thing anyway. They're not, not all going to jump the same height. They're not... One of the riders might be doing lateral work and someone else has got a young horse, so they're just going to go on one track. So um, I think it's important that you don't feel, oh, I've got to do this with this rider and I don't think that they're ready to do it. It doesn't work like that. The fact that they're there and being inclusive um, is a huge thing. I remember having this one girl at... Um, I had four others in the lesson and all she wanted to do was stand in the middle and do nothing. She was just with the biggest grin on her face because she was there, she was included. And so we had to make, she had to trot all the way around the arena. Otherwise, none of the others were allowed to canter. So they, they were really, come on, keep going. You've got to go the whole way around. So that was a really good thing to use that for incentive. But just being there is just wonderful. Um, yes, yeah, so so you want to talk on that? Oh, yeah, about the communication within the mm. in the within the session for the um, different types of, of disabilities. So um, Mary's pointing towards processing delay due to physical disability. So just to to understand that when you're giving a command. Um, that it may take that rider longer to process um, what you're asking because they've got a lot of things going on, um, ensuring that they're still maintaining, holding the reins correctly, maintaining their, their, um, their position, their balanced position. Um, they could, they're also inclined to fatigue earlier. So there's all those little factors that come into it that means that the uh, processing time can be delayed in what you're asking them to do. The other thing I find with um, inclusion in lessons, um, that you can actually, if you're needing to do uh, more walk activities, just to ensure that everyone's safe, um, especially the rider with special needs, then you actually can do a progressive lesson that does going from even say one jump to the next jump and you do that jump at the walk, but you're getting riders to ensure that they've maintained the medium walk, uh, keeping the horse into contact, um, really uh, over tracking, all those types of things. So it is in, in quite an advanced way, but then progressing to then being able to do that at the trot um, so that you've given everyone the chance to do it at the walk so you can assess how everyone's coped with that and then moving on to the trot. Um, if the rider's still not able to do that at the trot, then you're again making it a little bit more advanced for them doing it at the walk. So that's just a, another little tip that you can use. So. Here we've just got the spotter and the coach. And as you can see, everybody is concentrating, including the beautiful horse, uh, and it's safe. And she's actually part of a lesson. There's four other people going around, but we don't see them in that photograph. And, and you find that you, you do have to, as a coach, be, you, be, you will be coaching from the outer side so you can see everything, but then you may have to position yourself for different activities and especially when you're introducing jumping and jumping a course to assist for that rider to be able to um, follow direction and um, maintain the desired speed, etc. So then you may find that you come into an inner, inner spot um, in your teaching role there. Okay, so Sally and I had a lot of talk about what do we 
need to talk about with different disabilities? And the answer is everybody is individual. If you know that you're going to have a rider that comes to you with cerebral palsy, then you need to find out what type of cerebral palsy because there are different types uh, and how that person functions. So it's really that you're teaching the abilities of the rider rather than getting waylaid by the disabilities. So if somebody can't hold the reins uh, without dropping them, then you're going to have a look at what can you do to help them. But the only one that I, I really want to talk about is the, um, is the people that are on the autistic spectrum disorder. So we have a lot of in every classroom, there's probably at least one or two or three children that are on the spectrum. And when they come in and ride, you don't, they look perfectly normal uh, until they can be over emotional, uh, disruptive, all kinds of things that, but the main thing that I find that's the base of the problem. So what I look at is what's the result? This rider's getting very upset about something. So then you want to find out the cause. So if you're speaking to somebody with autism, they can be very literal in their language. So we use the word rain quite a lot. So we say, is it raining? Hold the reins. They may be keen on kings and queens, so they all know about the other kind of rain. So um, if you, I'll just give you one example, which is if you said to your rider, I would like you to shorten your reins, this is how the rider might interpret it. They're never going to actually get to shortening the reins. So first of all, I. So I is an I. It's not you or me. It's an I. Then you have a piece of wood. Then you have an emotion and they're not very good at identifying emotions. So they can see somebody laughing and think they're crying or the other way around. So I would like you. Now you is a very interesting one because to Sally, you are you to me, but I am you to you. So you changes from person to person. So that's really complicated. So they're trying to work out who is the you. So I would like you, and then you have a number two. So you've got all these things that are very muddled that they're trying to work out. So they don't hear shorten the reins. And they may well make the reins longer because what they've done is they've made the distance from their body to their hand shorter. Whereas you're actually, you want the rain to be shorter, not the distance, and then is it raining? So when you start teaching in a, so you've got your riders, but when you're teaching this specific rider, you need to keep the, words in the sentence really short and don't do any of the I would like you to you just say the person's name and then you give them the instruction with as few words as possible sometimes they react really well to Joe do this so you actually demonstrate what you want them to do as you say do this and that could be the shortening the reins. It's um, a really good tip to have in your mind. And then the other thing is that if you're, and this applies to most of these categories here, is that if you're showing somebody what to do, we tend to say, look at me, this is what you do with your hands. But what you actually need to do is to go beside the rider and show them as close to their hands as possible what it is you want them to do. So they can't see something and put it the other way around. They, they don't do mirror images very well. But 
what you do not need to do is go and get a book on disabilities, try and learn all about all the disabilities. And you might go, oh, well, I'm going to learn to sign. I might do signing for a deaf rider. But um, there are different kinds of signing. So you might learn to do one kind, which isn't at all what this person needs. So people who are blind like to be blind that are completely blind, not visually impaired. They get a bit cross. I'm not visually impaired, I'm blind. And it can be the same with people who are deaf. And they also like vision impaired, not visual. Visual, vision impaired. Yeah. Okay, my mistake there. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, now, if somebody has epilepsy and there are various forms of it, uh, the pony club should know about it and the coach should know about it and there should be a parent there and there needs to be. So you, if this person has an episode, then you're going to follow. You, you know exactly what you're going to do. So people can event. They can do all kinds of things. If they were going to be eventing and going cross country, then the doctor that's in charge of the cross country should also know. So that's just a thing. But it's interesting with epilepsy because um, nobody knows, am I epileptic? Is Sally epileptic? No, we, neither of us are. But if we were, would we have to disclose it? So there are some things that, but as a child in Pony Club, that would need to be disclosed. Yeah, and the other thing, intellectual disability. I think Pony Club is a, a wonderful uh, place for for those riders that are wanting a pathway to Special Olympics with their um, equestrian endeavours. Uh, and there's also a new um, um, organisation called Virtus, which is a parallel. Uh, competition platform for people with intellectual disabilities to the Paralympics. Um, and Mary's very involved with getting that started here in Australia. And that's good because the Special Olympics is more of a come and have a go and Virtus is equal to the Paralympics, which is equal to the Olympics. So you only have one winner, whereas in Special Olympics you can have lots of winners because people are graded according to their ability. So if people are interested in that and they've got riders, then we can Let certainly help you. Yeah. Yes. So teaching, keep teaching simple. Uh, so the terminology that we use with horses is really quite interesting. I remember in the Pony Club in England years ago, I had no idea what we were going to do. We were told that we were going to go to the Menage to do dressage. And we thought we we're going cross country. We had never heard of any of those words before. So you have to just make this, you have to make sure that people actually understand the terminology. Uh, We've talked a little bit about the length of instructions. And the interesting thing is that all these things here actually go with good coaching. It doesn't matter whether you're coaching someone with a disability or not. Um, so the length of the instructions, the number of the instructions. Um, oh, dear, I've got a spelling error there. Um, don't muddle with similar activities. So that would be if you went over trot poles, and then you wanted to go between them all, that might be really muddling for someone. And then with, um, with bending poles, bending up one side and then not bending on the way down might also muddle them. And there's also one in show jumping too, when you're building the course, that don't have blue and light blue and royal blue, navy blue jumps all in an area together, you have to have distinct different colours so that uh, yeah, a ride, when you say go to the blue one and there's different shades of blue, that makes it very tricky. So you need to have your red and your blue and your orange and your green 
so it, it is easier for the, um, the, the rider to know where jump one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is. So really, really think about that. And I think that's very helpful for actually all riders and all younger riders that are starting to um, do show jumping. And then there are different ways of demonstrating, but I think the main thing, so it could be that you do it on your feet, you could get someone else to do it. Certainly if you're teaching rising trot to riders, um, describing what you do um, is fairly muddling, but saying watch this person doing rising trot is much easier. Um, and as I said, go beside them rather than trying to get them doing the mirror image. I think rate of speech is also another important thing because uh, whether someone has an intellectual impairment or a physical one, um, they are going to take longer to process speech. And I find as I'm getting older, when people speak fast, I, I'm trying to listen to hear what they're saying and I don't have time to work out what it is that <laughs> they're trying to say. So I think, I yeah. think that the rate of speech is really important. And also the tone in your voice, the type of speech as well. So this is quite an interesting one. So if uh, a rider has um, cerebral palsy, spastic cerebral palsy, which it means their muscles go into high tone, if you actually, to get them to hear, um, have a higher pitch in your voice, um, that actually puts them into a, a startle reflex that they, that they can't, can't control. So you have to think about your tone being um, lower so that doesn't happen. And also people on the spectrum actually cope better if you speak more in a uh, monotone type voice. They're actually really good with the, um, um, the people when you're getting directions that are giving the directions on your phone. Um, they have a really good tone, so you need to um, listen to them and work out a, a, the best tone for people that are on the spectrum. Good. And then you have to work out if you need to prompt people. So if somebody needs five seconds to process and after four seconds you then do it for them, or you tell them again, then that can be really annoying to them. On the other hand, if they haven't listened and you wait 10 seconds, you're gonna keep waiting because you actually needed to prompt them. So there are no really clear, the interesting thing about teaching people with disabilities is teaching them without, it's very black and white, but as soon as you get into the disability area, it's very gray. Um, and this is something that I use with all my riders, uh, first of all, is it safe? Uh, and then is it effective? And is it progressive? So an example of that would be shortening the reins. So if somebody just shortens the reins by knitting them or by sliding their hands sideways, uh, it might be safe in an enclosed area. And it is effective because it shortens the reins. But is it progressive? No, because you don't want somebody jumping and riding out in the open when they can only shorten their reins by nibbling up the rein. So if something is not going to be progressive, don't teach it in the first place. So people take time to learn things, and so you don't want to have to unlearn and if someone has autism then you won't unlearn it there's how they do it the first time is how they'll keep doing it so just think about what it is that you want to teach them and if you happen to have a rider with quite a severe intellectual disability in your group then think very carefully about what you do because if you're trying to teach them to put rugs on and off they have clips 
and they may be kept safe in their gardens with a clip on the gate. So just make sure you don't teach them something that is really going to be dangerous for that person. I'd never thought of that. Hmm. Mm. Mm. Okay, on you go. Assess all activities. Um, so for every activity you do, the most important thing is the, the safety of the individual riders and then of the whole group of riders. So everything we do um, in our sessions has to have a beginning, a doing and an ending. And I think an ending to an activity ensures that it, it stays safe, safe for everyone. Um, and then we've got to work out is, is that um, uh, activity appropriate for, for all the riders that are, that are doing it. And that if, if you think, no, it's not, well, then you can modify uh, the activity to make it appropriate for everyone. And also, do you require help to ensure that everyone stays safe? So just recently, uh, we ran a grade six horse trials at Turudan Estate. Um, and we had a lovely little uh, course of 10 jumps but we actually ensured that we had um, spotters in different areas to ensure that um, if a pony or horse was getting a little keen and the, the, the rider just needed a little tip of how to uh, slow down and, and uh, make it safe to do that turn to the next fence, uh, they were there. So, um, and it, it just took the anxiety out for everyone and especially for the riders, that they knew that there were people on course that were going to ensure that they stayed safe. And Mary is very good at explaining the, <laughs> the breakdown, the difference <laughs> okay. to all these. Um, okay, so you have different teaching methods. So you have chaining. So uh, if you think of a of a task and you do a task analysis and you have a little link of the chain for each um, section of it. So putting a saddle on, um, your rider might just, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to find the saddle cloth and they're going to put it on. So that would be doing the first thing. The last thing that they're going to do is do the second girth up, the second buckle on the near side up. So if you were going to do reverse chaining, you would start with, you would do everything and they would just do the last buckle. Then, so the thing about the forward chaining is that they're then going to learn the whole exercise. But the problem is that if they do the first thing and then you do everything else, then they stand back feeling that they're a failure. So if you combine forward and reverse chaining, they're, they're learning the order of doing it, but they do the last thing, which means that they've actually completed the task. Uh, and shaping is so you couldn't get on using a chaining system. You can't say, well, today you can put your foot in the stirrup and next time you can put your other leg over. So you actually do, you do the whole thing and then you gradually do it better, like it could be sit more gently. Then you also, you do the whole task and then you see that there's a bit that isn't very good like standing on one leg. So they've got to stand on their right leg while they put their left foot in the stirrup. So then you would practice that uh, and then you can put it back into the whole task again and see if they can get on more easily. So when you're seeing a rider with special needs or even one that isn't and they're having a problem doing something, you've got to have a look at what part of the exercise are they finding difficult? And then is it something that you can practice not on the horse? And then the other thing with, with, with this is when you're doing a, a dressage test, 
say the grade six number two dressage test that the rider actually has to do the whole test you can't just pick movements and then get them to repeat the movement they actually every time they do it they need to ride the whole test and never do so you're going through a test and they ride a 20 meter circle that's the wrong shape so you say do it again because it was at the pony club in Victoria, it was the Pony Club Show Jumping and Dressage Championships, and my rider, who had um, special needs, did two circles because that's what we'd done the day before. So I think you really learn by making mistakes as yeah. a coach, and it's fine. But um, when they're going to, when you can do, so you can teach the test in sections like a circle one time and where the circle points are and then you can go down the centre line with where you look to halt and all of that. But when you actually put the whole test together, that is when you have to run through the whole test. Every time. Yeah. Okay, so it may be that you have your rider that only walks and trots and so then they can have a shorter lesson. I used to teach a girl that had um, quite a severe physical disability, a deteriorating disability, and her big thing was she wanted to go to pony club. So she got a horse from the Make-A-Wish Foundation and went to pony club. And so she, when she started to be tired she would say that her horse was tired now and it needed to stop. So that was really good. So if you have a rider that has a deteriorating disease or they don't have a lot of energy and strength, then it's a really good idea to say that the horse really needs to stop now and then they're not embarrassed by it. So you've got the physical fatigue, but you've also got huge mental fatigue. So if somebody's trying to keep up and they're not really understanding what's happening and they want to do it and they don't want to make a fool of themselves, they get mentally exhausted. When these children go home, they just go to sleep. It's really, the parents really love it because they have a bit of peaceful time. And then the thing that we don't think so much about is the horse coping fatigue. So if the horse is trying to interpret what the rider is asking them to do and their aids aren't very good and they could be sitting to one side but that's not an aid or they could have movement which also isn't an aid, the horses get really mentally tired as well. And so you can have timeouts for um, the horse's fatigue or the rider's physical or mental fatigue and they could just be with their spotter in the middle of the arena uh, or one edge of the arena or somewhere where safe and then join in again or they could just finish. And I think the other thing um, with riders with physical disabilities um, that you'll find that they'll have an optimum time that they're able to perform and communicate with their horse the best. Um, and this will seem pretty amazing, but usually it's around the 12 minute, 15 minute mark of their ride. So a lot of the pony club sessions are an hour a session and you have up to three sessions a day. So you really um, need to keep that in the back of your mind when you are coaching and also for um, chief instructors or DCs that are actually planning the rallies to have these um, time outbreaks. Yes. And the other thing is that the horses um, give you a clear indication They'll start to twitch an ear and when you know the horse is really well, you can say, right, this horse has got two more minutes and then it's going to have had it. So be aware if the horse behaves really well and then it starts not to behave, then the chances are it's just had enough for that session. 
Shelley. Yes, yeah, start of the lesson. Um, so this is um, how you really need it to to do this for everyone is to tell the writers the plan of the lesson. Um, and people that are on the spectrum really need these plans to be very clear and they need them to be time bound as well. Um, and I think this couldn't really help everyone that they know that they may be warming up for five minutes. Um, we're going to le learn this task of sitting on the correct diagonal um, for 10 minutes so that you actually break it down like that um, and move from one task to the other smoothly. Um, and if you do have to change your plan, then you have to let the writers know the new plan and, and why you've had to, had to do that. So that's just, again, moving to the next one, that, that you're, you are making rules and they are very clear. Um, and everyone that's involved and the spotter as well needs to understand those rules and the plan that, you, that you're making. Um, it lessens anxiety. Yeah, it certainly does lessen anxiety for everyone, <laughs> uh, especially us and especially for, um, for parents as well. Um, yeah, it's really important that everyone knows that there will be a spotter in the, in the, the ring and the, the role of that spotter. Um, and, um, and the spotter is, is helping a specific rider but may in turn um, assist other riders as well without taking the focus off, off, off their rider. Um, and I think this is a really important one to tell the riders that they do have an option to participate in, in that um, activity or not to participate in that activity. So, and I think, yeah, a big one we put there was cantering. So if the other riders are doing cantering, well, they will do um, that same figure that they're riding or activity they're riding, but they'll, they'll do it um, at the trot. Um, you may make it a little bit tricky. They may be doing a little bit of sitting trot in that activity or they may be doing some trotting in two-point position to um, in, show that they are doing the task in a, in a more advanced way way but not having to to canter okay so we'll go through this pretty quickly um why does failure occur um a lot of the time it's because either the horse or the rider don't actually understand what they're being asked to do uh then you've got the mental and physical fatigue it your lesson to you may be really flat out all the time, but your riders might not be at all interested in what you're doing, or they may get bored. So if you can have, so when I teach dressage to boys that jump, we don't even call it dressage. We call it schooling for jumping. And what do you have to do to get from one jump to the other to win a jump off. So then you've got their interest and then it's the same thing, but because you haven't called it dressage, they haven't switched off. So, and you've got their interest. If something isn't relevant to someone at the time, it's very hard to teach it to them. So the progression of learning riding skills is, um, is really good because then you can see if 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 it's going to be the right thing to do with them. So if you've got a rider that's only walking, then it's not relevant for that person to be told what the counter aids are. Um, too many instructions. Yes, you really have to keep it so clear um, with short sentences. Um, if there's no demonstration, then it goes back to somebody not really understanding what it is they're supposed to do. Um, insufficient positive feedback. What we tend to do when we've got a class is to, is to tell the people what they're not doing and what they need to do, but we don't keep going back making a comment on their effort. 
That's a really important one. Well, it is because if, if you told someone that they had to sit tall and they sit tall and you don't make a comment on it, then they're going to start slouching again. Um, and too many fails. You see, failure can be a motivator, but in so many times it's actually not. So you've got to try and um, make sure that failure doesn't happen too often. And particularly with a lot of these riders that are used to failing in what they do, they're also used to switching off. And several times I've taught people that I've just done too much, I should have stopped um, too much with them, and they literally stop in the middle of the arena and they close their eyes. And that's it. I go, done it again. Mm. Because in your enthusiasm for what somebody can do and you could say do it one more time in fact every time you do it one more time it's actually going to get worse because the reason why they're failing in it is because they're tired so you can't always use yes come on you can do better if you try harder that doesn't always work and there can also be too many distractions no, so well, you can talk. Oh, this, this is a is huge, very hard. Yes, it is. Because, a durability of yeah. how you're going to um, group a rider into the best uh, situation for an individual rider. So, so Sally did the best thing with Sarah on the black horse, and she put her buddy, that's a grade one rider in the lesson with Sarah so she could follow her. And it didn't mean that she missed out on her dressage or anything. She just spent half an hour yeah. being the leader. It worked really well. And then um, the older buddy, then she brought a younger horse to the next rally but still stayed in that uh, group with, with uh, Sarah. So she felt that that was perfect for her young horse to to be in that that um, lower group, um, and then it worked that Sarah then developed her own friends in the in that group, and um, and Jazz was able to to go back and be riding in the, the the higher group. I totally recommend that. That was just a wonderful way mm. of doing it, and and it really is helpful for the coaches if they are riding uh, with people of similar riding standards um, because then you can get your progressive coaching lessons um, for, for the year worked out. Um, so, and that's what we did with Sarah. But there's here again, this is a very grey area. I mean, you're certainly not going to send a rider who happens to be the same age as everybody else and only walks and trots out on the cross country. But also your rider isn't going to have um, the strength and endurance to be riding in all their sessions. So it might be just that the person that's doing the organisation of the timetable um, just goes, okay, well, now that group can do the dressage first and then they can do poles and gymkhana things and then they can do cross country so i mean you just try and do the timetabling to help them or it might be that this particular person needs to ride in the first group then have two hours off and then ride in the last group and it could be that they do two two flat riding type sessions so, so they're in two different groups yeah, yeah. but as we've got here there are no clear it is very grey, very murky. And if you do something and it works, stick to it. And if it doesn't work, then just change it. Try something else. And there is an activity that tends to work for everyone and it's uh, the working trails that used to be called handy mounts. Um, there's lots of wonderful examples out there on the net, but they are great for riders of different abilities within the one session to, to be performing. And we've actually been working on a, that will be on this Riding, tray. riding with Joan. Yes. Um, which are progressive um, riding lessons for people. But it's all, all with levels. activities. They're all activities. 
and it'll be quite different fun. activities, riding different terrain. Um, then there's yeah, targets. targets, which is like lovely mounted games that you can play. Um, and there's sensory uh, type activities with use of music and um, use of animal noises, all those types of things. So it's a it's a going to be a wonderful um, thing for the younger kids. Yeah, the younger kids. Mm. It's going to be great for those younger groups. Okay, so this is the Pony Club. Uh, Sally, you talk to this at the exemption this. process. So oh, exemption. So um, I'm a part of the. Pony Club Victoria um, exemption panel. So if you do have uh, a member at your club um, and you feel that they do need some assistance, then they do have to apply through their Pony Club to their state office. To compete. To be able to compete. Um, but it's also to be able to use um, adaptive equipment at Pony Club rallies as well. So um, so there's no concerns at the gear check um, for their uh, equipment that they're using. Um, yep, so you can uh, download the, the form from the website and then you have to um, make sure that you send it in with medical evidence of um, the person's condition and why they need the uh adaptive equipment or the compensating aids. Um, and some of the compensating aid things are, for instance, in dressage that they... We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there, sorry. Um, so, um, and then the panel uh, looks through the evidence um, and then usually I like to go and see the uh, member at their club riding. Um, if I can't do it at the club, well, then at video. their at their home. Um, and there's also been able to video them um, for us to to see them in action, for us to give a yay or a nay in reference to what they're asking for. So this is just a picture of Joshua, who's now ready for Pony Club. So if you have an RDA centre near you and the riders have taught the skills, then they're ready to come in and there wouldn't be very much difference with teaching Joshua than teaching anyone else. And Joshua really has learned level. how to shorten his reins. Yes. Yes, it's taken a few years, but he's got there. Okay. Oh, yes, so this is the um, special equipment compensating aids, so they must be safe and approved by RDA or FEI. So RDA Australia has um, a, a master list of uh, adaptive equipment and so does the FEI. And in the FEI it's called compensating aids. So um, this is a really good point that the equipment that they may use at home may not be safe for Pony Club. Um, sometimes if a rider has a leg that, um, that they feel is moving around too much, um, at home they may really secure that leg to the saddle and which means that the rider may be tied in to the saddle, which is not allowed under any circumstances. Um, a rider can have a Velcro strap that um, can assist to keep the leg there, but that Velcro strap can come uh, unattached if need be in an emergency. And unless they're paralysed, they won't get permission for that? No. Paralysed or um, incomplete quads are able to use that system as well. So we are working to make it as safe as possible for all riders. So this is a really uh, lovely example. This is Abby with her um, reins and the, strap. and the strap that's over, but it's an FEI rule that this, the strap cannot be over uh, the reins. 
because it gives an indirect line from the rider's um, stump to the bit, so as you can see there. She started with that, but and also just because somebody has an exemption or a compensating aid, they don't have to use it. Look so, at it now. so there is her. So the important thing with Abby is because she doesn't have any hands, she has to develop a really good seat, which she's just beginning to do now. And she she's done pony club and jumped and all kinds of stuff. And very exciting. She's just got her L plates. Okay. So these are some of the examples of the compensating aids. So in the dressage test or in the show jumping arena, that you're just saluting with head only. Don't have to put your reins in one hand. Um, another one that is uh, often asked for is doing rising trot instead of um, sitting trot, um, and that's usually with a rider with a physical disability. Or they can only sit. Or the other ones, yeah, that they can only sit. So those are the, the two options there. Um, riding with reins in one hand, if they've only got one hand, well, then they have to ride with reins in one hand, whereas the rule for dressage is riding with reins in two hands. So they may have one hand that's a bit wayward. And they actually, the body uses the hand to balance. So as they're going along, they've got one hand which is steady and one that's waving all over the place. So they would get an exemption to be able to ride with one hand. And also calling um, the dressage tests. So um, we have to zoom along here a little bit, but it was interesting with Sarah, who was in previous... Uh, slides. Uh, at the beginning, she had to have someone in the arena pointing to each letter of the arena, as well as having a caller on the outside. And she's progressed to now just having the caller. Um, you're certainly allowed to have someone in the show jumping arena um, pointing to the different um, numbers of the course. Uh, but they're not able to give instruction. They can just um, direct by pointing or to the blue one. Um, same with mounted games and same in the cross country. Um, that out in the cross country, you can have um, people that are out there as spotters or you can have one person that is um, out there and that person can actually be mounted um, to direct riders to um, each fence. And Headset. then Mary can talk about the he headsets and the Dharma system for riders that are so blind. The, so the Dharma system, each is for dressage and each letter uh, has a... And so you, somebody has, it's like an iPad and it's got the arena, and you press the letter, and then the voice comes out of the marker. And it, it means that somebody can um, do a dressage test without having to take eight people with them. They just take a box with the, with the talking letters. So it's very exciting, and it's gone through the FEI, and it's going to make a big difference because if somebody is blind and they have somebody calling the test that doesn't know them, they can, they can speak in not fast enough, too loud, forget to call at all, or they go, A, A, and terrify the horse because suddenly this A is far too loud. So when you've got the markers that all have the same volume and they all have any voice that the person wants to put in, so it could be their voice or their coach's voice or anyone else, and then you just need one person that presses the letters and they speak. Then they can go down the centre line because you'd press A, C, A, C, and then L when they go past L. That's it. It's, it's fantastic. It's really fantastic. But for people that have to have tests called and there are too many distractions, they can get permission to wear headsets. 
So now in um, FEI, they mostly have headsets. It took a long time to get that in. but And also organising committees really need to have a steward that goes and stands beside um, the caller yeah. in and, those instances. And if you have... If you're using the Dharma system for a competition, they need to go either at the beginning or the end because other horses are completely terrified because markers don't speak. Exactly. So then they go by and they hear a marker speaking and they are terrified. So, so, yeah. <laughs> I've also got a little t more tip with the show jumping. Um, with riders on the spectrum... Um, in walking the course, they should actually be able to walk, step over the jumps when they're walking the course because if you actually um, get them to go around the jump as they're walking the course, well, that's what they'll do when they're actually on course. Um, so there has to be a little bit of an exception there for those riders that they can walk the course and step over each jump. Till they get to grade they one, get, yeah. A grade. Till yeah. they get, yeah, <laughs> up the grades and then, yeah, look, develop a system. And they are very, very literal because I said to a girl last week, um, give yourself a pat, and she went smack on her thigh, completely terrified the horse, jumped. And, of course, it was entirely my fault for not thinking about it. Okay, so here are examples of special equipment. So there you go. Yeah, so... Um, a really good one is um, the elastic inserts in the reins. Um, Carl Hester produced them um, in the UK, uh, which are really fantastic. And then uh, other saddlers have been able to, to make them here really well. I think a really important one, and I can actually, well, you keep talking, Mary. Okay, so the rubber bands on the feet don't stop somebody falling off but that just means that they're less likely to fall off because they keep their feet in the stirrups. And so here we have, and I'll just show you how you do it. So you take the foot, you've got the foot. Let's take it off. So okay, so here we've got a rubber band. It's actually got a knot in it. But two it rubber bands. Two rubber bands Linked joined together. together. Okay, and you put it over their foot. Then you put the foot in the stirrup. Then you pull this down and it goes up and over the toe. So it's not going to stop somebody falling off, but it's going to keep them. Well done, Sally. Yes, yeah, so they do fall off. Yeah. Have you got any more surprises there? I've got a few more surprises. Good. So if somebody has cerebral palsy and one side of them is spastic and their leg keeps coming back, then you can attach the stirrup iron or the stirrup leather to the girth. But you really do need to get a bit of help with that because it may actually make their spasming worse. So and it can really it. affect their hips. So be very careful with that. But and the only thing you can use to do that is a spur strap. Not because you can't do it with anything nylon. It has to be able to be broken. Yeah. Okay. okay. And the mm. next thing we've come to is the um, a fixed handhold, and this is the Longden grip. And, it, and you see how it actually sits there and these bars go between the flap and the sweat flap, so slots in there, so then it's sitting in front of the pommel. And I, I actually have these Velcro straps um, to assist because I have riders that like to pull them out and I've used the, the, the holes at the end here to attach to the girth points. Well, they go behind the yeah. back of the yeah. saddle. Yeah, and they can go behind the back of the saddle. I've actually attached uh, this Velcro strap to do that. Good. Mm. Yep. And it works well. Excellent. And it's really good because it, it, as a coach, it makes you far less stressed because the rider can put, can grab hold of the fixed bar. If you just have a, 
a movable one, like a monkey strap, but they only work if you pull. So then you get a lot of problems with the horses putting their heads up. And here we've got... This is a, a type of loop rein. So you can hold here or the rider could hold onto the ball. But it's, it's very individual. Um, what I find about the reins is that the riders don't want to use anything which is not normal when they go to pony club. They actually want to be as normal as possible. So then you've got to say, well, yes, you don't need those reins, but you're only going to be able to walk because when you trot, you're not going to be able to control the horse. So do you want to ride or do you want to be like everyone else? So that some tricky things. And you have to really think of how you're teaching the rain aids when they do, they're using a, a, a loop because they do have to actually make a bigger movement to get the connection to the horse's mouth. But equally, you have to respect somebody that wants to be like everyone else. So it could be that you say, well, when you jump, let's put these reins on and for the flat work, have ones that slip because it's not going to matter. Yeah. And saddlers are getting really helpful back to the reins, developing loop reins to assist uh, riders' individual needs. So... So then it may be that they need to be in a stock saddle or a Western saddle or what are those funny ones that are between the two? They're called some... Uh, Half-breeds. Half-breeds, yeah, which can be really helpful. It could be that somebody's legs aren't very strong so they need two whips. Any of you coaches that ride, carrying two whips is no fun at all because it's very hard to to move your hands when you're holding on to the whips. And a seat saver might be something that's really good for the rider. It may allow them to ride for longer. Do you want to do any more of that? Uh, that was oh. just, it's just doing the, the thigh, the Velcro strap over the thigh. So I've got a Velcro strap there that actually goes between the flap and the sweat flap and then comes out and around and then does up across the thigh like that. But I think if people are going to be using that, there has to be a... It certainly has to go through the exemption committee yeah. because yeah. it has to be done correctly. Okay, so the thing about competition is people love it. Um, some people in Pony Club don't, don't want to compete at all, but a lot of people it does give them, it includes them, it gives them something to work towards, and it certainly helps them to reach their goals. Um, and then being part of a team is really good as well. So it might be that you had somebody in a games team, but they only actually did one of the events, but they were part of the team and it gives great incentive. And I also think that grade six um, is, yeah, really assists young riders and riders of all abilities. So, so here, grade six. this was on Sarah's mother's Facebook page. When Sarah first started to ride, her goal was set to compete in a horse trials event. I must admit, admit this was very ambitious and I doubted it would ever happen. But look at her go. Sarah rode the dressage, jumping and cross country with no instruction from anyone. Such an achievement if you understand the challenges Sarah is faced with. Thank you to Luke, her beautiful, kind soul quarter horse. Easy to zip. Thank you, Dalmore Pony Club. So thank you and enjoy adding to the quality of life of pony club riders with special needs. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. So um, we'll move on to questions now. So if you would like to ask a question live, 
then you can use the raise hand function, which is on the webinar. So if you would like to do that, we'll then um, unmute you so that you can ask a question live. So we had a couple of questions. Um, uh, what's the best way to let a judge know at a competition about a rider with special needs? So I think there you saw that um, Mary and Sally spoke about the exemption process and the recording of that exemption on the member's profile. So we've developed up a national form that all states will be using. And so that will enable a exemption to be put on the rider's profile and that will be then um, visible to uh, someone at a competition or by them carrying a card. I'm not sure if there's something oh, else. Pardon. Mary yeah. and Sally, that you would like to say there? Yeah, that, well, it's a part of their, their grading card in Victoria, yeah. so it's it's on that. Um, and you've just got to make sure the organising committee um, has a copy of that um, and then the organising committee to inform uh, the judges uh, of uh, that, that writer's um, exem exemptions. And it also another area that it sometimes gets missed is at the gear check. Um, also, the gear check needs to have that as well. Thank you. Uh, the next question, does a rider have to um, ride HC at a competition if you're calling a show jumping or cross-country course? No, no, that's what the exemption is about. It's an exemption to the existing rules for that rider to be able to complete, compete on a level playing field with all other riders. Right, thank you. Uh, do you have a photo of a fixed pommel bar? Is that the Longdon grip? Well, the yes. Grip. I that's named after you, Mary? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Is that the fixed pommel bar? Yep, she has a grip on a saw. <laughs> I don't think I've got the thing. I don't know where it got is. A, no, I can look. I'll. I should have brought a saddle, but that it does it. It becomes very fixed um, when it's placed under the saddle, and you can use the little ring hole at the end there as well and then you can tie something to that to tie to the back of the saddle. I've also done the Velcro mm. strap that can come round. And if you look at all the Paralympic riders, you'll see some in the grade one with, with it on. So it's, it's excellent for young horses too because it means that when they go into canter, you don't have to be scared. You just put your hand on the bar and then the horses don't buck because you haven't pulled the reins. So there are lots and of it's uses for it. Helpful for stabilising the outside rein. Mm. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's a very good tool. Uh, the next one's about a specific case about a specific rider. So we might skip that one just at the moment. Um, but Kintara, if you wouldn't mind writing down there what state you're from, that might be helpful. So we'll move on to the next one. Um, is there assistance or training for judges when it comes to judging a rider with special needs? Oh. Oh. <laughs> are you judging the horse or are you judging the mm. rider? <laughs> when, I judged, when I judged at the Paralympics, this friend of mine who judged at the previous one said to me, a word of advice, don't look at their faces. Only look at the horse because then you're not, you don't look and go, oh, isn't that a cute face? Oh, you know, they're trying so hard to get the horse to trot when it's supposed to be cantering or something. And so then that stuffs your marking up. So you judge them perfectly normally. Like you judge everyone else. Yeah. So at the lower levels um, in Pony Club, it's a lot about are they going at the correct speed or tempo and are the circles round and are they accurate? So it's exactly the same for having 
a rider with a disability. And all judges need to know is what's on the exemption card. But it doesn't but change yeah. your judging in any way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next one is uh, from Siobhan, who knows you, Sally. Sorry, Hi, Siobhan. Questions are moving. <laughs> um, and it's about coaching of deaf riders. Um, I'm currently coaching a client with a cochlear implant and I use a microphone pen around my neck. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to learn more ASL, um, but it's hard to find horse-specific signs. Is there anywhere that I could find that or could I? do I have to make them up? So horse-specific um, signs. Mm -hmm. RDA has a, um, a booklet which has more equestrian or specific stuff. Yeah, it's the Makaton system. Um, so that they that can be purchased from RDA Australia. Um, I think I think the best thing is for her to talk to this rider and say, "Are we gonna? Does that mean trot? Does that mean stop? Uh, can you see that? Is that canter?" But the important thing about teaching someone that's deaf is that. Uh, you can't help them. Like if they're coming into a jump, you can't say kick because they can't hear you. And then they tend to look at you as they're going over the jump to see what you're going to say because they want to lip read what you're saying. But, so they have um, to come up and you have to face them. So if you've got a if you've got a class, I never get the riders to stand facing me in a straight line. I always get them on a semicircle. So they're all equidistant from me. And then nobody's at the end of the line because the ones at the end of the line never even listen. So you would just have to make sure that your rider who can't hear is bang in front of you and that you're actually speaking to that person all the time. And I've also taught um, with the rider having their own sign, sign language person with them. Um, and that's worked really well. And then when you're teaching jumping, then I strategically um, put the sign, signing person um, in, in front of the fence. So, I mean, on the landing side of the fence so that she can be signing stuff to her. And it's great for getting her to look and focus ahead um, as I'm, I'm giving instructions, giving um, ideas to improve the whole the whole thing so yeah if you can get in with a, a, the person that does a lot of signing for that rider which is really helpful and that's likely to be the parent so I was the other day I was doing a demonstration and we had a deaf rider and her mother was there doing the signing and that worked really well yeah. Can you spell, is it Makaton? How do you spell that? M -A -K -A -M -R no, it's not RDA. It's, it, it's the Makaton system, M-A-K-A-T-O-N. And you. it's a lot, it's a, and it's like, that is up, that is down, that is toilet. <laughs> so. That is barbecue. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's quite an e it's quite an easy one to learn. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next one is: Do you have tips for ways to explain to the non-disabled riders in the group um, in a way that doesn't overshare um, or make the person with a disability uncomfortable? Um, how how should you deal with that? With is it the parents of responsibility that how's the coach deal with having um, explaining the needs of that rider with within a group I tend to do it more as a general thing that we all need to um, keep our spacing and etc so I tend to do general stuff that is um, making everyone aware of each other and aware of the the needs for the 
the rider with a disability. I think you you can do it in a in a more general way. And I think well. the other thing is that if you were going to do, maybe you're going to do a three loop serpentine. You actually you you teach that person before they come into the lesson. So you'd show them on a piece of paper. This is how. You, this is what we're going to do. Yeah, that's really good too. So they actually know what they're going to be asked to do in the lesson. And it would be good if you could do it at the end of one rally, gives that rider homework of what you're going to be doing the next on the next rally. So, I mean, that does take some special planning, but it's, it's a, a good technique to have that they've got homework to do. And the other thing that I do, which probably the coaches listening are going to have a fit about, is if I teach somebody who's also taught by other people, then the rider has a notebook and then after every lesson I will put in what I did because it could be that I'm doing a certain aid and then the other. And, the, and for instance, like canter, there are three perfectly classical canter aids. So you might teach one and I might teach another one and then the rider's model. So you just say cantered with this aid or worked on something. So that can be helpful as well. But the coach is might not do that. This, this one follows on a, a bit from the teaching a group. How do you go about talking to the other riders who, was, uh, who may ask, well, why is that rider doing something different to the rest of us? Because I said so. <laughs> <laughs> because they tire easily. You, mm -hmm. And I would actually talk to the parent. What would you like? That's a really good question to ask. So yeah. you would ask the parent when the riders ask. So, okay, so when this girl came and stayed with me that had cystic fibrosis with her make-a-wish pony and went to pony club, she would stay, but she stayed in the house, not in the bungalow where the other riders were. And they would say to me, why, why is she in the house? And I said, well, she has a cough and she's going to keep you all awake. You're not going to catch a cough, but then you're not going to get a good night's sleep and then you'll ride horribly. And they were all fine with that. So, and then some of them would say, you know, is she going to die? And I'd say, well, we're all going to die at some point. So <laughs> that's life. And I think it's, I think that's very good. But it's quite interesting that, um, of the people that Sally and I have taught over the years with integrated riders, a lot of people have gone on to be occupational therapists, speech therapists, physios. Yeah, it's true. They're in the industry because they've grown up with it and they like, they like working with people. Mm. So it doesn't hurt people to be told just I need one minute with this rider so that she can then join in. But I think that suddenly, if you don't tell the riders and suddenly you have a spotter in the ring and it's all different from normal, then the parents and the riders are going to go, well, we don't want these people here because they're taking time that should be teaching my child. But I think when we do it right and it works really well, uh, and I, th I think the buddy system is really so vitally important for making it work. And then there are just all the benefits because you get some little shy rider who is the most fantastic buddy and they take them around and that's really good. Yeah, that's wonderful. That yeah. Helps. But I think you certainly just you really have to be just up front and um, yeah, just make everyone um, aware of while you're doing this sort of stuff to keep everyone safe. And anything that the coach isn't happy about, 
Like maybe you were doing trot poles and then you're going to go on to jumping and you don't feel that the rider should be jumping. Don't jump. Don't. You are in charge of the safety of all your riders. And it's just like saying when somebody says, can I jump one hole higher? And you go, no, the horse has had enough. So it's no different than that. Thank you. Um, and the last one is a comment rather than a question um, to thank you for talking about the horse's needs as well as the rider's needs um, in, in this challenge. So thank you very much. And that's all the questions we have. And it's nine o'clock in the east of Australia. And I uh, just wanted to thank Mary and Sally again so much for your time and for answering all of the questions. Um, and for the contribution that you've made to enable riders to participate, people with all abilities. So thank you so much for your contribution to all of those people and made such a difference in the lives of so many. So, um, and uh, so I think then we'll we'll sign off. Um, yep. Can I just add, yeah, sorry, go Mary. Can I just add yeah. that Sally and I do a lot of people contact us and say, what should we do? Mm -hmm. So I think that the Pony Club should have a panel of people like Sally that you can send a video and then she can comment on it. So I think that people shouldn't feel that there isn't any help available. There's a lot of help. You just have to know who to ask. And I think obviously you would ask your state or the national body or somebody. And the other thing is we do a lot of interstate stuff as well with RDA. So keep an eye out if you ever see any of that advertised um, because I was in Canberra not so long ago and um, there was a, a rider that needed to be seen for some adaptive equipment and I was able to slot that in when I was in Canberra. So, yeah, we can, we can do that when we in Queensland or wherever. So we're desperate to help you all. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got one person with a specific question that wants to talk to you, Sally, at the end. So we might um, let everyone yeah. else go and, um, and that person can, can wait to have a private conversation with you, Sally. Yep. That might be Certainly. the way we go. And um, so thank you very much also to Monal from Pony Club Australia for getting us through um, the technology, this is our first time using the Zoom webinar function. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Happy coaching. Right. Happy everything. <laughs> thank you very much for your time and thanks everyone. Okay. Bye.